next on Unsolved Mysteries. After murdering 48 women, the Green River Killer is finally behind bars. But did police get the wrong man? Could the former pilot of the Delta Queen, dead for over half a century, be playing matchmaker from beyond the grave? A police captain is found dead. Detectives say he killed himself. His family calls it murder. An Oklahoma farmer is lured from his home by a mysterious stranger. He hasn't been seen since. Five cases, some without endings. Our team is working on them, and perhaps you can help. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Police spent 20 years hunting down the Green River Killer. A man named Gary Ridgway has been tried and convicted of the crimes. But some believe that the wrong person is behind bars. Seattle, Washington. It was one of the largest serial murder cases in US history. Two years, 48 victims, all young women. Most of them were prostitutes along the SeaTac Strip near the Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Nearly all of them were strangled and dumped in a remote area. Thousands of leads were investigated, hundreds of suspects interrogated. One suspect stood out. His name, William J. Stevens. He was a petty thief, in and out of trouble with the law for most of his life. In 1981, he simply walked away from a minimum security facility where he was serving time for burglary. Over the next eight years, Stevens avoided arrest, dividing his time in the cities of Seattle, Spokane, and Portland. Bill Stevens was an alienated, um, disaffected individual who never held a job. He fit all the FBI profiles of serial killers his poor relationships with women, a mother who throttled his personality and development. He was raging to his friends about how the prostitutes of the SeaTac Strip were spreading the AIDS epidemic. My brother told people on several occasions that he wanted to kill women. He wanted to torture them. He wanted to cut them up, dissect them. He wanted to fill them with rocks. He wanted to fill them with concrete. And he wanted to still put all of this on tape. He thought that would be neat. King County Police, Chris, take the back. January 1989, acting on several tips, police searched the house in Spokane where Stevens lived with his parents. They uncovered a stash of guns and police badges. They also found dozens of Polaroids of nude women, most of them prostitutes. In another room, Police discovered dozens of pornographic tapes and fraudulent credit card receipts from 1981 to 1989, the years of the Green River killings. Stevens also had a fully equipped police car, which he had managed to get registered to a, a, a non-existent city. He had an ambulance, a police motorcycle. Investigators later searched a second house in Portland where Stevens lived until 1985. In the basement, there was a secret room which can only be accessed by using a garage door opener. The secret room first came to the attention of a neighbor who lived uh, outside Portland at the same time Stevens did. He invited her in to see this room. In the room, as I remember it, uh, there was a bed and on the bed was a mannequin, a store dummy that was uh, dressed in women's underwear and uh, was uh, struck in an obscene pose. 
In January of 1989, Bill Stevens was arrested and charged with felony escape in a series of weapons violations. That summer, Stevens was publicly named as a prime suspect in the Green River killings. But within months, authorities had cleared Stevens based on an alibi provided by his younger brother, Bob. I visited him in the King County Jail, and he mentioned that he couldn't have done the killings because he was on a trip in Connecticut visiting me in 1982 when the killings first happened. After that 1982 visit, Bill Stevens then joined his parents on a cross-country trip. Bob produced receipts which seemed to prove that his brother was still traveling with their parents when the first five victims were murdered. Additionally, we were able to determine that Stevens was not in the Seattle area. He was either in Spokane or, or Portland or Vancouver, Washington on the day before or the day after 19 Green River victims were last seen. However, Bob now believes that his brother got away with murder at least 48 times. I really believe my brother is a Green River killer. It's a surprising twist for Bob, the very person who provided his brother with an alibi. The police had the killer behind bars in 1989, and I helped get a killer away free. Bob Stevens now questions whether his brother was in fact with their parents when the first five murders were committed. My dad had told me that my brother didn't always leave with them. He would always just maybe just kind of join them somewhere, or just appear on their trip and then leave again. That was his way of providing a paper trail. He used my parents as his alibi. Bob Stevens has never contacted us and provided us with any information contrary to what he initially gave us. This is uh, basically news to me. Bill Stevens died in prison of cancer in 1991, seven years after the murders officially ended. We've explored the reasons why the killings may have stopped. The suspect could be dead, could be incarcerated for another crime, could have moved to a different part of the country. Roderick Thorpe claims that the authorities did not reinvestigate William Stevens for one simple reason. The police are involved in misdirection here because they don't want uh, the public looking too closely at the various roles Stevens played in his life. He believes that Stevens was a police informant. Police are only as good as the information they get from people who live, as Stevens did, on the edge of society. A guy like Stevens is constantly giving them information about more serious criminals. But at the same time, he was indulging in his, his little sport there, which was the murder of uh, young girls. Bill Stevens was never an informant with the local police departments and was never affiliated with any of the local police departments. There's no cover-up with regards to uh, the investigation of William Stevens. He's simply not the Green River Killer. Critics of the investigation still insist that Stevens could have been the serial killer. One theory even suggests that others may have been involved. It seems very clear that Stevens did not work alone. Stevens' phone bills were in the possession of the police, and one of the detectives told me that they were puzzled about hours and hours of long-distance calls to a certain number. What were they talking about? There is no evidence to support the theory that there was more than one killer. Long telephone calls to a friend are, are, are not in any way incriminating, and they, in many cases, tend to provide him with alibis. There have been killings since that are Green River type killings, suggesting that the person who was Stevens' accomplice has continued. Update. Gary Ridgway, an early suspect in the Green River killings, has been arrested. A lab matched his DNA to evidence found with a number of the victims. Ridgway was arrested, and he eventually pled guilty to murdering 48 women. In exchange for the plea, he was given life without the possibility of parole. 
Despite the evidence, Bob Stevens still believes that his brother, Bill, was somehow involved with the Green River killings. Next, a woman flees with her son after trying to murder her husband. Eight years later, she's finally behind bars. Redwood City, California. We recently told you the story of Gilbert Ortiz, who suddenly got sick at work and was rushed to the hospital. After drifting in and out of consciousness for two weeks, Gilbert told police that he thought he might have been poisoned by his wife. On the day Gilbert got sick, Elizabeth brought him a special bodybuilding drink at work. It was pre-mixed in a plastic sports bottle. It looked like a real shake. I mean, like a real chocolate shake. And then when I tried it, it sort of like burned my throat. And then my throat's really, really burning, you know, and I was all shaky. And then I felt like getting sick. Paramedics rushed Gilbert to the hospital. Elizabeth Ortiz met them there in the emergency room. Doctors hoped that she had a reason for Gilbert's sudden illness. Have you ever seen that bottle? No, never. I've never seen it. We needed to know where that sports bottle came from, if it was something that was purchased and it was really a, a bad mixture that really made him sick or whether it was a deliberate mix. This is Sequoia Hospital. Tests showed the shake had been laced with a common insecticide. Police obtained a search warrant for the Ortiz apartment. There they discovered Elizabeth Ortiz had vanished along with her son, Jonathan. And then that's when it hit me. She did it. Then. When he told me, I said, where's the baby? He's gone. That really got me. Elizabeth Fuentes Ortiz became a fugitive, wanted for attempted murder. Update. After following up on thousands of reported sightings of Elizabeth Ortiz, Sergeant Catherine Anderson finally got a break. I received a phone call from the FBI telling me that they had Elizabeth Ortiz in custody in Mexico. When Elizabeth was arrested in Mexico, she was by herself. The FBI gave me their word that they would continue to look for the little boy in Mexico in the area that they had arrested Elizabeth in. Elizabeth Ortiz was brought to Redwood City for trial. But where was Jonathan? Assuming Elizabeth would arrange for her son to visit her, Anderson had this age process composite of Jonathan posted at the jail. I received a phone call from a deputy telling me that they had a little boy at the jail, and the little boy was a dead ringer for the composite picture that we had. Jonathan had been brought to the jail by a relative. The following day, Gilbert finally was able to see the son he had been missing for eight years. He was two years old when he disappeared, and. When I got him back, he was 10. I mean, yeah, as soon as I saw him, he, he just came and hugged me. That's all it took, one big hug. I cannot explain what that felt like. Gilbert and Jonathan began the long process of getting to know one another as father and son. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Fuentes Ortiz was convicted of attempted murder and was sentenced to 25 years to life. She served her time and has been released. New Orleans is home to a living monument of the romantic era when steamboats worked the Mississippi River. Built in the 1820s, the Delta Queen is a national treasure. During World War II, she transported wounded soldiers to hospitals, and then the boat was refurbished to carry tourists. But there is another side to the Delta Queen, and it's a scary one. It was a stormy night in New Orleans. The Delta Queen was laid up for repairs. Her first mate, Mike Williams, was the only person on board. I was quite exhausted and was sleeping a very deep, solid sleep uh, when I was awakened by a sound as if someone had said next to my ear. 
I was quite startled because I was couldn't understand how someone could have gotten in my room and out so quickly without me hearing the door open and close. There was a very loud Hello? slamming of a door back in the after cabin lounge area. And I had personally made sure that every one of those doors was locked before I had retired. There was not supposed to be anyone on the vessel. I proceeded down several doors until I arrived at cabin 109 and it swung open in my hand. I was a little frightened and intimidated. I took a flashlight and looked in the room. There was no one there. Mike had heard stories that the steamboat was haunted. He had always dismissed them until now. What happened next would change Mike Williams forever. Two women came into his life. One was a co-worker on the Delta Queen. The other had also worked on the ship. The only difference was that for 50 years, she had been dead. Mary Green was one of the first women to ever pilot a steamboat. She was in charge of the Delta Queen when it was purchased in 1947. Mary was 79. After only two years of piloting the boat, Mary died. Where? In cabin 109. The same one that was mysteriously unlocked. Another night on the Delta Queen. Hello? Myra Fruge, a new yes, Delta Queen employee, was working late. I received a call from an elderly lady in a cabin, and she stated that she was cold, and she was very uncomfortable, and could I please send someone? At this uh, particular evening, Mike Williams was the mate, and I called up there, and he answered, and I told him the situation. Hello? It's the mate. Does someone need help? Myra had sent him to cabin 109. The beds were made, little mints on the pillows. The room was obviously unoccupied that cruise. It was around this time that I had this feeling that somebody was behind me or looking at me. And certainly through the window, I saw this little round, benevolent face but something was eerie about it. I thought, well, perhaps that's the lady who needs assistance. So I walked out of the purser's office to see if I could catch up with her and talk to her. And she wasn't there. There was no one outside on the decks. I was, you know, a little shook up, and I went back into the purser's office. Yeah, come in. Miss Fruge, I uh, just came from room 109. There's nobody there. And you're sure it was 109? Absolutely. They checked the passenger list. No one was registered for cabin 109. Myra was so upset by what she had seen that Mike offered to walk her back to her cabin. He didn't mention that she might have seen a ghost. Wait. That's the woman I saw. The woman in the portrait was Mary Green. It was very, very scary at, at first. Surprising, too, because I just saw her on the deck. But uh, for me, it was uh, kind of exhilarating. I began to suspect that someone was trying to introduce me to this young lady. Myra and I became very close. We just clicked. Each one of us had something that the other needed. The ghost of Captain Mary had become a matchmaker. Mike and Myra fell in love and got married. I believe sincerely that so long as I care for this vessel in some way, that the Captain Mary Green's spirit will protect our family and guide us as she has. Next, a police captain is found dead of a gunshot wound. One suspicious death, two theories. Murder or suicide?
Cook County, Illinois. Captain Michael O'Mara of the Cook County Sheriff's Police was the straightest of straight arrows. He was a devoted husband and father, the only officer in the Sheriff's Police trained at the FBI Academy. O'Mara became famous for leading raids on the Illinois Mafia. He spent his later years at a desk job in the records department and was getting ready for a quiet retirement. It never happened. At the Cook County Courthouse, a sheriff's police patrolman pulled into the private service area to gas up his car. An unmarked police car was parked at the pumps with the gas nozzle in the tank. Yet no officer was in sight. As the patrolman's flashlight searched the lawn around the service area, it flashed on a gruesome sight. Hello? Michael O'Mara's body was slumped over a rock in the middle of the lawn. He had been shot once through the forehead. His wallet and his briefcase had not been touched. There was no sign of a robbery. But Michael O'Mara's record of fighting organized crime made murder a real possibility. We approach a death scene as possibly a homicide initially. Who did this? There was a gun uh, to the uh, right side of the, uh, of the body, near the right hand, and there was a very visible gunshot wound to the forehead. There was a flashlight found next to a rock that we can identify as his flashlight. The gun is his gun. And there was one bullet that was discharged from that cylinder of that weapon. The victim's pockets were intact. His money was intact. His car was intact. You've got nothing in any way, shape, or form to say that there was anybody else there. If you were going to weigh this, there would be more weight towards a suicide or an accident than there would be towards, towards a murder. Two weeks after Michael Mara died, the coroner determined his death was a suicide. Mike's family could not believe that he would kill himself. His wife, Barbara, recalls he left the house that night in good spirits. Right before he left, he said he was going to stop on the way back to get yogurt, and he asked everybody what, what flavor they wanted. And uh, of course, it was the day before payday, and he didn't have any money in his wallet, so he asked me for some money to go. Barbara, do you have any cash? Thanks. Why would he take my last couple of dollars to get the yogurt if he was planning on not coming back? See ya. It doesn't make any sense. In this case, you can take any isolated fact and say it can be consistent with suicide. The problem is, is the whole scenario, uh, when you look at that, is not that of a suicide. Barbara O'Mara hired Dr. DeMaio to review the case. There was no financial problems, no personal problems, no fatal disease. That does not completely rule out suicide, but it kind of makes the conclusion that a death is suicide a little more difficult. The man is found dead in a field with a flashlight next to him and his gun. His car is parked nearby with the gasoline nozzle inserted into the tank. This does not sound like a suicide. It was kind of bizarre. Based on his investigation, Dr. DeMaio believes Mike was murdered. The evidence of the scene suggests that Mr. Mara began to fill the tank of uh, his car when he saw or heard something in the field. He then took a gun from his briefcase and went to investigate. When he got into the field, he met somebody or a number of people, and he was shot. When our investigators went to the scene and they looked in the field, there was no evidence of, of a struggle. The police still say that O'Mara killed himself and they consider the case closed. But if Mike O'Mara was murdered, what was the motive? Could it have been a long lost enemy from his past or did he have an enemy in the sheriff's department? Based on the information that I have in front of me, 
it tends to be suicide. I don't have any evidence in front of me that would conclude that this was a homicide and we need and we're looking for the offenders. But Dr. DeMaio points to one additional fact that argues against suicide. When people uh, shoot themselves, they tend to put the gun firmly against the head at the time of discharge. In this case, the muzzle of the weapon was between two and four inches away from the skin. And you could see that by the powder tattooing uh, on the skin around the entrance wound. See ya. He may have chosen to have it not be a contact wound because he taught homicide investigation. He taught courses and he taught about suicide. And so if he wanted to make it look like something other than it was, he may have deliberately done that. It wasn't an accident. He was purposely shot. And uh, why it's being covered up or whether they know or anybody knows, I don't know. You know, what happened out there, I'll never know. But suicide, I'll never believe. If you have any information about the death of Captain Michael O'Mara, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, did this man leave his family to get away from it all, or is he the victim of a mysterious stranger? Cheyenne, Oklahoma. It began as a typical morning at Leonard Derrickson's dairy farm. Jared, breakfast is ready. Leonard made breakfast for his 19-year-old son, Jared, and the two sat down to eat before a long day of chores. Then, a visitor arrived unannounced in a white pickup truck. Hey, Jared, you know whose truck that is? Mm-mm. I'll go see what he wants. Leonard spent several minutes talking to the driver of the truck. They did not appear to know each other, but their conversation seemed friendly enough. When Leonard returned, he told Jarrett that the man wanted to look at one of his stud horses. Let's put about uh, 25 bales out in that backpack. Leonard gave no sign that he found anything unusual about the stranger. So he told me that he was gonna go with him. He said to stay here and go to Elk and get some feed and go feed the cows and he'd be back that afternoon. Jared Derrickson is still waiting for his father to come home. Nobody has any idea what happened to Leonard Derrickson. Police found no signs of a struggle and no evidence of foul play and no body. The only clue is that mysterious man who came to Leonard's house. After leaving his home, Leonard Derrickson did not simply vanish. Two hours later, a waitress claims she saw him eating breakfast with another man at a local coffee shop. Now, that's a little odd to us because at 9 o'clock, Leonard just got through eating breakfast with his son. It's extremely odd to eat two breakfasts in the same day, two hours apart. They were uh, sitting there in the restaurant, and the unknown man that we're trying to identify was doing most of the talking, and Leonard was just uh, drinking coffee and listening to the man talk. The man at the diner matched the description of the man who picked Leonard up at his home. There was nothing suspicious about the man's behavior, and if he had meant to harm Leonard, why would he be seen with him in a public place? Yet neither Leonard nor the man turned up that day at the barn where Leonard kept his stud horses. Leonard was apparently seen again six months later. This sighting was even stranger than the first. A man at a bar in Amarillo, Texas, phoned the police. Yeah, I want to report this guy, Leonard Derrickson. He's supposed to be missing. The individual that called stated, I know Leonard Derrickson. I'm from Elk City. I can't give you my name, but he's in this bar. I'm watching him. He's wearing a blue check shirt, and he's drunk. 
By the time the local police arrived, both the caller and the man he claims was Leonard Derrickson were gone. We have no reason to disbelieve it. It would almost stretch the imagination that a guy would dance around in the bar screaming and hollering, it's Leonard, it's Leonard, and it not be Leonard. I believe he was in the bar in Amarillo. Leonard had recently suffered through a painful divorce and was having business difficulties. Could he have just decided to walk away from it all? There is only one problem with that theory. Leonard's son, Jared. Me and my dad, we was together every day. Every morning we'd go work, do the chores, and I'd go to school. I don't think he would have ever left me and not ever come back to see me or nothing because it's we well, was close and i don't think he'd ever done that to me if leonard didn't just walk away from his life the focus then switches back to the mysterious man there's a possibility that that this man was involved in setting leonard up uh, to be murdered if this man didn't do the murder he may have taken Leonard somewhere to someone that wanted to. That's a possibility. We just, we don't have a motive for that, uh, have not found one. This is a composite drawing of the man last seen with Leonard Derrickson. Police would like to question him regarding Leonard's disappearance. If you have any information that can help solve this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a sudden death in a doctor's office and a deadly insurance scam begins to unravel. When a patient dies in a doctor's care, it's usually treated as a routine death and the case is closed. And that's exactly what Dr. Richard Boggs and his partners in crime were counting on. Glendale, California. Around 7 a.m., paramedics responded to an emergency call at the medical office of Dr. Richard Box. Inside, they found a man lying on the floor of an examining room. Box said that his name was Melvin Eugene Hansen. Boggs says that he received a phone call from one of his patients, a long-term patient, Melvin Eugene Hansen. The man said he'd been drinking heavily, he was having chest pains, and he wanted to come in and be examined. Boggs said Hansen had been a patient for seven years. He agreed to meet Hansen at 5 a.m. for an EKG. He brought Hansen in, examined him, left him in a treatment room by himself to rest for a few minutes. I really don't think you have any need for an alarm. Why don't you just lie down here for a few minutes and I'll be right back. Then Boggs went into another room to sort through things while he was waiting for Hanson to rest when he heard a thud. Boggs said he rushed back and found Hanson lying unconscious. He immediately called 911, but found it was busy. Boggs said he tried to revive Hanson for 30 minutes, and at 7.04, he finally reached 911. Finally, paramedics arrived. He, the body was pronounced dead at the scene. Originally, it was just a normal death, just a natural death in a doctor's office with a doctor in attendance. The cardiovascular problems. When paramedics examined the body in Boggs' office, they noticed that its condition seemed inconsistent with the doctor's story. He's got some rigor in his neck, in his jaw. The onset of rigor mortis suggests that the death had actually occurred much earlier than Boggs was claiming. In fact, the EKG tape revealed the machine had last been used just after midnight, not at 5 a.m. How long do you say he's been down? Suspicious. Paramedics called the police. Dr. Boggs ignored basic life-saving protocol. A doctor is not going to try and help a heart attack patient in his office. He's going to have an ambulance waiting for him. Dr. Boss, could you tell me a little more about the 911 call? His uh, comments regarding the 911 bothered me. He had told us he had gotten a busy signal. Uh, 
that time of the morning, uh, I found it hard to believe that he'd get a busy signal on a 911 system. Three credit cards and a copy of a birth certificate were discovered in Hansen's wallet. But there was no ID with a photograph of Hansen. Police asked for an emergency contact. Boggs provided the name of Hansen's business partner. John Hawkins, Columbus, Ohio. H-A-W-K-I-N-S, yes. Boggs was one of the most respected physicians in Southern California. Police were reluctant to further question him without more evidence, but there were rumors that he was financially overextended and that his practice and medical license were in jeopardy. The most probable cause of death is acute nonspecific myocarditis. When the body was autopsy, no the pathologist noticed something peculiar. The body is noted to be that of a Caucasian male, appearing to be younger than the stated age of 46. Then the autopsy was interrupted. Hansen's business partner, John Hawkins, arrived to claim the body. John Hawkins and Melvin Hansen co-owned a chain of successful clothing stores. Hawkins said he needed to settle Hansen's affairs quickly to get back home to his business. I'd like to show you the receptacles. What I really need to know is, when is the body going to be cremated? When John Hawkins arrived from Columbus, Ohio, he made arrangements with a local mortuary to have the body cremated. When Hawkins learned that the ashes would not be scattered until a much later time, uh, that being up to a month, uh, he was upset business there. I need to expedite this as much as possible. Is there any other way? Hawkins, uh, through the mortuary personnel, uh, located a local scattering service that uh, scattered those ashes the following day. Flando Police Department, Austria, you go to Mal. Two months later, this case took another intriguing turn. On June 9th, a, a detective received a phone call from an insurance company representative who informed him they were about to pay a $1 million life insurance policy for the death of Gene Hansen. The beneficiary of that policy was John Hawkins of Columbus, Ohio. The representative inquired if the photographs of the body had ever been compared to any other known pictures of Melvin Hansen. Up to that point, that had not occurred. The detective sent away for a California driver's license photo of Melvin Eugene Hansen. When the photographs arrived, police realized the man found in Boggs' office was not Melvin Hansen. The detective contacted the insurance representative immediately, and it was too late, and that the insurance company had already paid out the $1 million to the beneficiary, John Hawkins. But if the dead man in Boggs' office was not Hanson, then who was it? Police used fingerprints to match the dead body with missing persons reports. The body that Boggs had identified as his patient, Melvin Eugene Hanson, was in fact, a 32-year-old bookkeeper named Ellis Henry Green. John Hawkins, the man who had ordered Green cremated, now had some explaining to do. Investigators followed up on John Hawkins. They found that he had abandoned the residence that he had lived in and later discovered his convertible Mercedes parked at the airport top-down He's still in the ignition, uh, indicating an obvious uh, quick exit uh, from that particular area. When questioned again, Dr. Boggs continued to insist that the man found in his office was the man he knew as Melvin Hansen. Right there, the same man I identified to the other officers. Have you ever seen the other man before? Nope. The police weren't buying his story and issued a search warrant for Boggs' files. His phone records showed frequent calls to Hansen's business number and, more suspiciously, to John Hawkins. Boggs also received calls from Wolfgang von Schnoden in the same night that Green's body was found. Police wanted to know why and put Snowden's name to law enforcement agencies around the country. Several months went by after Ellis Green was found in Richard Boggs' office. 
Then a suspicious acting man was interrogated by customs officials after getting off a flight from Mexico. In his bag was $14,000 in undeclared cash. Let me see your bag. Why? Wait, I can... When the customs agent searched uh, the man's bags, he discovered uh, not only the identification that he was using at that time, but he also discovered photo identification of the same person with the name of Wolfgang von Schnowden. But the most critical discovery was the original California driver's license for the dead man, Ellis Henry Green. Take off your sunglasses. Why? Take off your sunglasses. The customs agent made a computer inquiry and learned that uh, Wolfgang von Schnowden was in fact wanted by authorities. Within a few hours, the man who carried ID as Wolfgang van Schnowden was finally identified by his real name, Melvin Eugene Hansen. Melvin Eugene Hansen was alive, yet Boggs claimed that he had died in his office. Police began to piece together a conspiracy to pull off the perfect crime. Melvin Hansen and John Hawkins were business partners. Police believe they came up with this plan. First, they would murder a perfect stranger. Then they would switch his identity with Hansen's and finally collect the million dollar insurance payoff. To cover their tracks, they had the body cremated. Five days after Hansen was caught, Richard Boggs was arrested at his Glendale office. He was charged with insurance fraud and the murder of Ellis Green. Richard Boggs was convicted of first degree murder. Both he and Melvin Eugene Hansen were sentenced to life in prison. John Hawkins was eventually caught in Italy and convicted of fraud and conspiracy. John Hawkins served his time and has been released. <laughs> 